Yo! Video games. What up, dudes, and welcome back to the O Video Games Podcast. I'm Matt. And I'm Andrew. Once again, thank you to all our generous patrons who kept us going for over 450 episodes. Yeah, if you're interested in becoming a patron at any level, please check out patreon.com slash Podcast. Due to the week is Bojack. Thank you, Bojack. Uh, I've known Bojack too long, seven, 17 years. Yeah, well, th- thanks for putting a number on it. <laughs> half, Almost half my lifetime. <laughs> no, no longer. Yeah, well, that's uh, that's your problem. <laughs> you're you're older than me and uh i'm actually you know what i feel gypped is i'm the one that started going bald at like 23 and you still got full I, people won't know this but when we first met you had long beautiful metalocalypse hair yeah. like hair literally down to your ass like full-blown metal did you have bangs no you didn't do bangs no no, oh, thank God. That's uh, I. I was gonna try and find one mistake you made. You don't even have that much gray hair. It was bullshit. <laughs> what are you talking about? I, I, am, I am super salt and pepper, salt um, and pepper fox over here. I know, I know, right? And and you know, I'm only you know, I went gray early. I'm only twenty five. Twenty five is a good year for you. <laughs> <laughs> it's a solid year. <laughs> but speaking of solid years, uh, a lot of franchises are not having. Very solid years, namely Final Fantasy is not necessary. Yeah, this, we're jumping right into it here today. So might as well. I I wanted to start with like PS5 Pro Cope just to like hack the algorithm again to try and like rile some people up. But uh, I think we said everything there's to say on it. Like if you want one, you should buy one. You'll be happy with it. It's just like they're never going to push the technology. That's all because they haven't even pushed PS5. Yeah, and, and it's funny because there are, you know, the more tech heads are like, oh, no, this is really crazy. This is really good. You know, this is, um, you know, this is a 4070 and you're getting it for like way under cost and yada, yada, yada. And and the thing was, is again, I went back and I, I, I can't remember if I talked about this last time on the podcast. Apologies if I did, but I went and I played Horizon 2, you know, and and, and, and I booted up my, my clear save file because the game is exceptionally beautiful in the end game the second half of the game is way more pretty Mm -hmm. than the first so i went to the redwoods and i went to the bay area and i was showing it and i showed it in performance i showed it in fidelity showed it in both and i showed how honestly like it really like yes the lighting is is a little downgraded in 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 performance but i'm like okay like you're still seeing all the trees all the branches all the bushes on the ground everything reacting real time to the wind and the wind changes and and the sun you know shining through the leaves changing dynamically in real time as the sun you know sets and stuff like that and all the crazy effects in performance when it's like yeah look at my piece of crap 500 dollars is worthless junk you know thing is so terrible and the thing that kind of and and it kind of hit me and you know this is going to sound because the thing is like yeah obviously like our particular listener base may not be aware of this but it frankly has to be said, and, and, and I'll get to the asterisks here, but Horizon 2 almost looks a generation ahead of Rebirth. Like, I think Rebirth was a nice-looking game, but having gone through Rebirth with upscalers, with expensive upscalers on performance mode, and then seeing Horizon 2 again and what it what that game is doing with the graphics and environments, it's significantly better like and then obviously this is a decima engine versus an unreal 4 yeah um, I, and i get that but like it, it's really showing you okay here but my point in this in all this is is that what when you have sony money and and in in-house sony tech you know hyper focused on the one system which is really kind of almost kind of odd in, in a way because you know again there was a it's a console exclusive still for for rebirth but like it's really showing you what a hyper focused dev team can do with because because here's the thing like horizon one came out in 2017 and like horizon two came out in like 2022 i think or 23 22 or 23 it was like five years mm-hmm. later if i remember right it um, was it it felt fast 
It was fast. Yeah. And that's the thing is they had part one, which was a brand new game on a brand new engine on a PS4. And then they had part two, which was a full sequel on an updated engine on a new console together. So in remake it was a PS4 game on Unreal 4. And then we talk about how great it was, how they kept the staff and they were able to just take all that learned knowledge. And really, well, well, kind of what I'm getting at here is just that like one, I Square is not the not the king of graphics any longer, like an optimization, like what Guerrilla Games were, were able to yeah. do on a graphical level, specifically just for PS4 and then five years do a full blooded at that's not even counting the giant ass dlc campaign in between you know uh, frozen wilds right. yeah um and a giant ass sequel five years later on on a brand new system with all kinds of new bells and whistles and even able to make it cross-gen and rebirth wasn't even able they weren't even able to do a ps4 version of rebirth it was ps5 only and you have horizon 2 and this this horizon 2 looks looks almost a console generation ahead I now granted does Horizon 2 feel fun to play? No. <laughs> How dare you? But on a purely... T and I beat it. I beat the game. That's the funny thing is I noticed like a lot of people, I know, especially with the, um, the, the, you know, I don't want to get, I don't want to be too insulting, but like one thing like, like that, the, the insane Sonic fandom doesn't really seem to understand with me or really with your vegan cave. So it's true. Max and Kenny probably don't play much of Sonic. They don't play Sonic at all. I beat Sonic Adventure 1. I've beaten it more than once. I've Sonic Adventure, I've beaten Sonic Adventure 2. I've beaten Sonic uh, um, Hero, Sonic Hero, sorry. Oh my God. You right. know, I've beaten Sonic Heroes, beaten Sonic Colors, beaten Sonic Generations, you know, I've because beaten you hate your games. I have beaten the games. I've beaten Sonic in the Secret Rings. People think like, oh, you know, I used to hate her. He just sees one thing. You just, he just, I, I the, the new thing is now that I am, I am just, that, that we're just collectively forming our opinions you know, based on what other edgy YouTubers said, you know, some, some five, 10 years ago, I'm like, no, 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 no. I beat these games. Okay. Like behind me, behind me, <laughs> I have beaten these Sonic games. Okay. Like they're not good, <laughs> but you love them still. You love, I Sonic love, I love, I love 2D Sonic, 2D Sonic a lot. Um, I, you know, I know it's blasphemy. I, other than the music of most Sonic games, I've, Oh, that's the blurs of Sonic. Always blessed with good music, but gameplay in 3D is... Oof. Well, I, I I have this problem with most of Sonic to me outside of maybe one or two levels is totally... I can't remember it. Well, that's the funny thing is that was literally a pointed thing saying that that's, that's a... That's a trope. That's a misnomer. That's a that's a meme. That's you know that's a, that's a slang that people think and is not true. And I'm like, three mm, D games is pretty true. Oh, I well, to be fair to Sonic fans, like I I think the last three D Sonic I played was the first three D Sonic. So Sonic Adventure. Yeah, probably. Uh, was that the one that I was on Dreamcast? Yeah. Yeah, that's the one I played. That's one and the last two. one I played. Sonic 1 and 2 were on Dreamcast. I, Adventure. I, I own the first one and played maybe an hour or so of it. And then the next time that I played it, it was for free at a McDonald's. You remember how McDonald's used to have like game consoles in a... Mm -hmm. Yeah, they had a Dreamcast at the one um, over near where uh, Game World used to be. Uh, they had one of the, the Dreamcast stations... Mm -hmm. And that is the last place that I ever played it. And that I was a much younger man. <laughs> <laughs> um, so totally fair. If they're saying like, oh, Andrew can't have an opinion on Sonic. He hasn't played him. True. But I have. You have. I, yeah, no. It's... Well, the Sonic is an interesting thing because it's, it's, a it's an evergreen franchise. It's a franchise that's sort of stood the test of time. It still, it still has a fandom. Still has a... And, and the thing is, Sonic is still... Um, it's still pulling in the Utes. Um, the Utes is going to be kind of a big running theme here, and, and it's pulling in Utes, kind of in a way Pokemon it pulls in Utes. And Pokemon, I, I kind of, I, I know we're on the eve of them just announcing they're they're suing Power World, but um, <laughs> well, but did anybody not expect that? 
Right. Well, I think people like, figured at this point, maybe, I guess not. They, they just weren't going to bother since it's been so long. But now it's funny because came out, they didn't sue, they didn't sue. And then Sony bought them and they didn't sue and they didn't sue. And now, now just randomly time to sue. <laughs> so Made the um, maximum amount of money it's going to make. They clearly found something. I To me, I'm like, I, I think they didn't want to just jump into a court case because it looked it looked derivative. I think they were, they wanted to see if they're smart. Come on, man. They're a smart company. Um, they're, 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 they're assholes, but they're smart. You know, yeah. they're, they're, they're not going to jump into, into a copyright infringement case unless they, they're pretty, pretty dang sure that, that, that they saw copyright was infringed and dang sure that they can actually make money out of it, that the court right. case itself isn't going to cost them everything. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so, I mean, but that, you know, all that being said, uh, Pokemon, I do kind of, I kind of like almost res somewhat respect the mentality they have, which is I'm not interested in growing with my audience. I, I get the six to 11 year olds. We carry them for about five years and then we reset. We, we start a new generation, new starters, new area. And we just, we go for the next wave of six to 11 year olds. I knew a lot of people in their 20s that were playing like adamant playing mm -hmm. every Pokemon. Well, that's the thing no. is like, they're not against adults playing their, their games. But they don't just forget them. You're right. Yeah. They're, no, not target. they're like, yeah. I'm not, I'm not like, I'm not trying to grow, you know, I'm not trying to do like, okay, my audience, you know, we've been at the game for, for six years, seven years now. Our audience is now teenagers. We got to appeal to the teenage crowd. Let's introduce a character that had, you know, has a gun, you know, and has this tragic backstory <laughs> where like nobody loved them. the one person who did was murdered, gunned down by a bunch of rogue, you know, agents, security agents. Wait a minute. That's Sonic. I, I love the idea of a Pokemon that it's special powers. It just has opposable thumbs and it uses guns. <laughs> It has a thumb and it's here to kill. <laughs> like, yes. Bioengineered by Team like, Rocket to use a rocket. <laughs> which is why you're not in charge of the Pokemon company. Correct. Yes. Because so, I would have made it the best. So I, I almost kind of respect their idea. Or like, look, we know who we are. We know what we are. And 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 we're doing the smart thing where it's like, it's like Disney. Honestly, this is the Disney route where it's like, I make a movie for six to 11 year olds. And then the next movie is for six to 11 year olds. And then the next movie, and then departments of my company will branch off and try to do, you know, things that are more like teenage focused or, or, or a little higher, but we never, we're never trying like, and then hell, if we want to do R rated movies, we'll make touchstone pictures. Right. Yeah. But or they got into hot water because they built an entire Marvel universe that ate up all the rest of the industry. And now the industry doesn't know how to make anything, but basically Marvel or Marvel clones. And look at where that's led them. Right. I mean, well, I mean, Disney. that's that's a sort of that's a that's a box office way. But like, I'm just saying, like, the general idea is. No, I agree. I actually Disney's not interested in making that PG thirteen. I mean, I would love it, but like, they're not interested in making that PG thirteen version of Frozen two or three or whatever. Right. No. Right. I I get what you're saying. I also think that like Nintendo is a good example of how we say like Nintendo cleans up because they know exactly who they are. Right. They they stole yeah. summer because they came out and they stuck to their guns. They make exactly what they make. You know, they're not chasing anybody. Nintendo yeah. feels weird, actually, because it's not chasing anybody. I think part of the problem with both Sony and Xbox right now is that they're both chasing. They're like trying to they're, they're trying like, to fall like up. serpents eating their tail at this point. Right. Yeah. They're very Ouroboros. Um and they're not going to last seven. Sorry. Uh, you got to make if you can't make a Resident Evil reference, you know, why not? Um, but one thing that I think is a problem with like this is with the PS5 Pro Cope. Uh, you've seen people be like, oh, no one batted an eye at the Galaxy edition of Xbox Pro X, X, whatever. The, the point is like one we did. We did we specifically, or at least I specifically. I mean, we, 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 it got one good, ha, huh, and then like, yeah, that was it. Like, cause no one expects we, that to do well. Um, but my, my point is, is like Microsoft clearly hasn't been able to figure out what they want to do for two console generations now. 
Yeah. They've sort of had like Phil Spencer when he first got there, like he sort of seems like he has ideas. Sony post PS4 success, like has proven that PS4 was a was a fluke. It was an accident. They didn't have a plan. It just worked out that way. And what you're saying about like Pokemon knowing they don't chase, they just they go after the six to eleven year olds. They know what they do. They know what they do well. Nintendo has done that. Nintendo knows what it does and knows what it does well because they already they made that mistake, right? They chase with the GameCube. Yeah. They they sort of chase with the Wii U, which you've also sort of called out. Is they they're not going to do that again? People that think they're going to make a Switch Two that looks exactly like yeah, the Switch. I, I I saw because you know as of the as of the recording of this, there's 3D render leaks of, and then there's like multiple unconfirmed yeah. possible assembly line pictures of the Switch Two, and it's basically a Switch. It's like a it's bigger, just just like stretched bigger, like take Photoshop and like pull the corners out, like not not like not like fatter really. But it's just like bigger eight yeah. screen, like a Switch so, Pro. Yeah, it's a little more. It looks like a Switch Pro. It looks like what you think a Switch Pro would look like. And I'm just kind of like, and, and I'm like, I, do you do we really think they're just? I don't know. To me, my my initial gut is like this is almost it's way too safe for Nintendo, which is why I kind of don't believe it. Where I'm like, this is too safe. Like, just the same exact theme, slightly bigger. They're gonna call it Switch. And people think that the Wii U failed because it's called Wii U, and this is going to succeed because Switch Two is not Switch U. It's Wii. It's it's Switch Two, not Switch U. U is what throws people off. It's all you called it Wii U, and that's what confused people. But Switch, I mean, Switch Two is obviously a lot more easier. Like, okay, yeah, Switch Two, I get it. You know that I get it than the than the Wii U. But I'm just. I'm just sitting here thinking like, okay, they're going to put a $400 allegedly, like I'm assuming a $400 console on the market. And it looks exactly like the one they're still selling. That's 300 or 200 even for the switch Lite. And I'm like, okay, this is just, this is just going to cause marketplace confusion, you know, to me for, for people, you know, people buying this, the casuals buying the system, the parents, the grandparents, the whatever. Right. Um, and, and then, and then people are going to be like, wait a minute, my switch, game doesn't work on the new on my my switch the switch this new switch zelda game this new 3d mario won't work on my switch it has to be a switch too like i to me i'm like i i personally don't see that i i can't i can't see nintendo even calling it switch too i think they probably i've said they're gonna call it like the nintendo snap one of the big persistent rumors was that it has um magnetic joy cons rather than slide rails because right now it uses slide rails to go right. in and out and this was going to have magnetic snap-ons. And I'm like, hey, call it the Nintendo Snap. It's a new system. It's got a new name. It snaps. It doesn't, doesn't slide in and click. It's So um, that's 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 just sort of my my sort of like, yeah, I think they'll call it something like that. Um, so to me, that just, to me, that just makes the most sense because that's like, it's a wholly different name. I expect there to, uh, my, my guess has always been they're going to go focus way more on cameras. Um, it's going to have like, you know, 3d camera not even 3d camera but just like you know I, if you notice like phones like the like they started out like small and then there was like there was like two two lens yeah. like two lenses now there's like fucking you know, four or five like this three yeah. like, die, like, <laughs> I mean, it's, like it's it's looking more and more audacious but i'm like yeah i think nintendo's gonna do more you know, ar too i think AR, they're gonna do a lot more, more ar more photo stuff yeah. i think they're just gonna go back to that maybe i don't know this is my guess so anyways, yeah, my, my whole thing looking at this rumor is I'm like, I don't think they're just going to sell you a bigger, better Switch called a Switch 2. That sounds like what you want. <laughs> it doesn't sound like what I think Nintendo would do. I'm not. Personally. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't know how safe Nintendo is going to play it. Um, you know, I think one of the things that like people I would be tempted. I'm not even going to say people. I would be tempted to say they might play it safe. Uh, just given supply issues that they've had. Mm. You know, it is maybe... a different world. It is a different world. Now, I'm not yeah. going to be shocked if, hey, what if it is just a Switch 2? What if it is looks just like a Switch, but a little bit bigger? What if what if this all is accurate? What if this is just the case? I'd be like, okay. Yeah, I all mean, right. a, a Switch that's as powerful as a PS4 and, you know, all right. Um, yeah, and then, and then all the other things I've heard too, where it's like, yeah, when you dock it, it's beyond a PS4 Pro. It's closer to a series S, but not quite without you know. and it that's all without DLSS, right? Like yeah, and then DLSS to, to bring it up to 4K standards, DLSS 3.5. I'm like, 
Sounds all good to me. Uh, but this is this is like the this is and this is the thing that like I wouldn't it be funny? Wouldn't it be funny if Nintendo reacted? Because they don't react, but like just considering how botched that PS5 Pro presentation was. <laughs> and I mean, unless you're real into Sony, that that was a that is a bafflingly weird way to introduce an, a system upgrade. I know it's not a new system, but a system upgrade. Um I feel like Nintendo could literally just like bend Sony over and then spread its butt cheeks and then like use its thumbs, you know, to, sp to spread like the starfish and then just go and just ram it in because they could announce. And that brings me to the topic of our, of our episode, Yaoi and the various definitions. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but... Now we usually save this for, for a side quest, but, uh, yeah, I man. You know, Andrew had you know. Andrew had to ask me this. What was there? Was you? Someone followed you, and I was like, you "Oh, were like uh, yeah." So I, I got onto Blue Sky, uh, and got I gotta look this up because it's it's the Emperor of or the Ambassador of Bussy. Now I'm sure Andrew knows what Bussy is. The patron saint of Bussy. The patron saint of Bussy. You know, and I'm I'm here for the Twinks. You know, do you <laughs> be? Be all you can be. Uh, the patron saint of Bussy is maybe the best name I've seen in quite yeah. some time. And then, and then he's had some description. You were like, "That's what's this exactly?" And he, yeah, he had a he had a description talking about Yowie, and I uh, I asked the only person I know of that would know of the hentai. And thanks, I, uh, I'm honored. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Matt, tell me, I'm just a sweet Catholic so boy. I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, yeah, well, I'm like it's a subgenre, and it's strictly male to male. Like, it's not like, oh, you, you, you know, you can get either way. I'm like, no, no. So there's, 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 and there's, there's, there's hentai. So all you Christian listeners, close your ears. Which is animated pornography, and then the subgenre within the animated pornography is yaoi, which is strictly male to male, um, male to male gay sex sexual and drawn animated pornography and then if you wanted female it's yuri which must be be weird to all those russian russian men named yuri <laughs> rough <laughs> you know which is female to female the subgenre and, and then like and then there's all these other ones we could get into and i just won't <laughs> i was just i was very vulnerable and i i said uh <laughs> mr matthew please, please save me a google <laughs> Please save you a Google. Yeah, if you ever, okay, if you ever have any weird question about that, you could probably ask me. And if I don't know, I, I definitely know. I definitely have moderators that would know. <laughs> who are who way more into, into it more. Than, I learned a lot just from streaming. You know, just from like certain certain terms. Be like, what the heck is this? And we're an educational I, podcast. <laughs> Ahi gao or whatever. And I'm like, I don't even. Know, I still don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. <laughs> I uh I if you are if you're out there you're listening patron saint of pussy uh be proud that's a great name genuinely made my whole night now are you a furry or a scaly both I don't know I if, imagine I well I don't know if feather has a I don't know if feather is like an offshoot of scaly since scaly's evolve into feathers but or or, was, or 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 maybe they don't you know and just just to annoy your your wife <laughs> it's is a scaly so Scaly's a furry who likes lizards. Yeah, lizard people. You know, snakes, Elder Scrolls, lizard men. You know, right? Okay, Argonians. Okay. Uh, for those of you that Big aren't patrons, rough lizard lizard people. Um, we haven't Tongue. we haven't been getting a lot of requests for side quests lately. We haven't done a ton of side quests lately, but usually I start them by going over a new kink. Um, I guess you know, we like have tongue one. tongue lasher from Shira, which is a big buff snake man. And when in hindsight, the name tongue lasher for a big buff snake dude is either the greatest thing or the most unfortunate thing ever. Patron saint of of uh, scalies, yeah, tongue lasher. Hell yeah! Uh, sorry, there's there's our little mini side quest for the episode. Um, <laughs> I derailed the shit out of that, <laughs> but uh where were we <laughs> switch two and now it's gonna bring in all the the yaoi enthusiasts it's gonna come with yaoi on it no well i okay i guess what, what i was saying is like nintendo if they wanted to they could just oh that's right yeah because here's the thing it's like they had this bungled 
bungled reveal of the PS5 Pro. Now, Sony, I would imagine the rumor is that they're about to have a state of play, and which uh, to me is like this, the big saving face thing, which don't know why you didn't just introduce it with that. But um, although although the leak is that it's going to be Horizon 1 remastered. Why? Well, Sony's <laughs> Sony's in such a pickle. They they really like Jim Ryan. I, I don't know if it's even Jim Ryan's fault, but it probably is Jim Ryan's fault. Left them in such a lurch of like they are just they don't have any creative happening. Maybe is what it is. like. This is an outside thing. I don't want to. I'm not trying to insult any of the creative professionals at Sony. I swear to God, it just they're doing nothing but remakes and remasters and. Like except for the remasters, everybody want or the remake everybody wants Bloodborne. Uh, they're just not green. It's everything, that, I guess. everything, blood, everything but Bloodborne. Right. Also, what are you talking about? They had an original IP that they spent a lot of money on. <laughs> Which one was that? It only lasted ten days. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about. It's it's dead and gone now. We don't <laughs> we don't speak its name. Um. No, I mean Concord is uh, is. A... You're right. Actually, we should talk about that. They did try to do a new franchise. Did they pick maybe the worst way to launch a new IP? Yeah. Yes, they did. But I, I genuinely, I mean this. I will give them kudos for trying to launch a new IP. Yeah, uh, I would like to see more new IPs. If anything, it feels like Astrobots are almost like an accident at this point, which maybe goes hand in hand with their whole their whole success lately. Astrobot has hit me with such a dose of like childhood nostalgia of like just having a summer day where I played it. Like I genuinely Astrobot brought me actual joy, you know, and that's rare at thirty <laughs> six in this day and age. <laughs> like genuine <laughs> childlike joy. <laughs> Right. And, and, and the see this, because that's everyone talks about how that's usually like, you know, this it's so Mario. I'm like, yeah, that's Mario's court usually, which yeah. again, if Nintendo wanted to right now, I keep saying they could, they could, you know, they could, oomph them. They, yeah. could they could drill the dildo into the butthole real hard. Why? Because all they have to do is show their new system, show brand new Mario game, like a big 3D, beautiful Mario game, a brand new trailer for their new Mario Kart, which has sold like 60 million copies of, of eight, right? They could show a massive scale horizon level monolith soft game with whatever they're doing next and literally just sit there and go, and it's $399 and it's a hybrid portable plug-in console. Buy. Like, are you sure you want that $800 system now? <laughs> you know, like, the thing is, it would be the first thing ever because it, it, it would be the most cutthroat, you know, uh, console war y thing they could do. But it would, it would, it, we, we, you and I, people like you and I would get a huge laugh out of that. Like, I was wow, man, sure funny. you bungled the, you bungled this. Here's your, here's my $800 upgrade. That makes my PS4 games look better. And then well, and, and here's my $400. This is a massive step up for Nintendo gaming. Especially because Nintendo is technically still a generation behind, right? Yeah. Cause the, the switch is basically a PS3 pro. So they're two generations at this point. So, you know, yeah, I mean, they're whatever they show early next year, they're gonna win. Um, it would be very funny if they showed it early. If it came, they shocked everybody and just here it is. But the the things that they're gonna show for PS Five next, let's say in the next couple of weeks, it's probably gonna happen. I, I mean, I really, I mean, I hope it does because for their sake, it's they have done nothing to convince anyone even the enthusiasts of you know why you why we need a pro i guess if you really wanted to see rebirth you know with with good graphics at, at high frame rate it's like you gotta oh, i gotta i gotta see it i got it's gonna be so good to play and i'm like yeah and and even 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 with graphics mode on it doesn't like 30 frame mode of rebirth doesn't even look half as close to as good not half as a little hyperbolic but doesn't even look close to as good as horizon two does in performance on a base ps5 and again that just kind of speaks volumes to this it's square's just not there anymore i mean i'm glad they got that game out now here's the thing i don't want to diminish what they did with unreal 4 because it was tough what they were doing was tough they were they were doing 
seamless open world stuff on on an engine that's not particularly well suited. Epic was doing it though with Fortnite. That map is that that map was huge, and they were loading it in with a hundred players yeah. before it switched to five. It was running on four, and it was it was doing it well. Now, the graphical styling and whatever have you of Rebirth is obviously a lot more realistic and dense than say the Fortnite map was. But other than Epic, you weren't really seeing people making giant open world games on Unreal Four. So I don't want to diminish what they had to do, but they. They only they had to do that because they painted themselves into that corner with remake. It was a sort of unfortunate thing where they had to make a decision at the time to go with Unreal Four for remake because Luminous was a was was a flopping mess. around was a mess, and only one development team in their own studio knew how to use it. And so we they, should point out that obviously Rebirth is a beautiful game. It what? still is a good looking. Yeah, it's still a some asshole's game. gonna hop in and be like, uh, "Oh, you guys are acting like it's so ugly." Yeah, no, and, it's I, and I'm and game. I'm just and I'm, the reason I'm saying Horizon Two looks so much better, like, is because to me, I'm like, I'm pointing out that my PS5 vanilla base, you know, whatever console verse, whatever you want to call it, the my vanilla PS5 running a cross gen game like Horizon Two in performance mode looks incredible, right. So I am not being upsold. Like I, I, I'm saying like this, this upgrade is so the, the returns of the visual returns on this is so diminished. I, I think it's insane to ask people to pay. Let's be real. 800 bucks, you know, for this full upgrade. Yeah. And I mean, you know, obviously um, I don't think it's worth upgrading right now because PS six is only let's say three more years away. About three, probably three. Probably yeah. three. They might go for four more. That would make what eight years for a generation. Um, they might. I don't know. I don't think they will, but they might. But the point is, is like, okay, you're gonna buy the pro and in three. If if you already have a PS5 vanilla, just no point. Just wait yeah. till the six. It felt like it felt like the PS4 Pro was was a bigger boost because. It, because the thing was with PS5 Pro, I think the thing that's getting me is is that they weren't talking so much about all these games will now run at 60. It's now all these games can run graphics mode at 60 rather than we just can't do 60, period. Right. Because most games being made, again, looking at Horizon 2 and, and Ghost of Tsushima, and, and that's, I know it's a PS4 game, and, you know, God of War, Ragnarok, and whatever, like, they're running at 60, and they're looking gorgeous. So, yeah. like, I don't... I eh, I'm very eh on 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 the whole, but it could but it could look crisper at 60 frames. I'm like, I don't care. I want to I want to jump topics a little bit because it's something that you you touched on, and then I dragged us back into PS5 talk, which I shouldn't do. But um, when you're talking about like Final Fantasy, or you're talking about like Rebirth. One rebirth just didn't do as well as everyone was hoping, including us. Like we were hoping rebirth was going to do a lot better, but Final Fantasy in general is not doing particularly right. great. So, yeah, this is here's the thing: people got really mad, and there was a lot of mud flinging. There's argument. Twitter was blowing up because everyone was saying you don't know what you're talking about. Blah, blah, blah. Square has come out and officially said it. This came from, and you can get it on their website hd.squareenix.com english you know english letter explanatory whatever um i mean i can look at it right here it's their fiscal year ending yeah uh their 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 literal fiscal report and this was reported on um takashi mochizuki and then backed up by daniel Lamad. uh here's here's the exact quote on square enix's website to their investors here are our digital entertainment segment results in the HD games subsegment. We released multiple new titles, including major titles such as Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth, but profits unfortunately did not meet our expectations. And then further, just, just a little bit later, skipping ahead, the HD game subsegment booked net sales of 99.2 billion yen up. 20 billion yen year over year and an operating loss. Okay. So people will say like they had a net sales. I'm like their operating loss, which is the money they spent um, of $8.1 billion um, loss widened uh, year over year. 
it, it, it's in other words, they lost four billion more at all. They yen, sorry, they lost four billion more yen this year than they did the year before. Right. Um, despite the release of Foam Stars <laughs> and Final Fantasy VII Rebirth in Q4, because again, Q4 ends March 31st. So this is, they're talking about all the sales that they made up to March 31st, 2024 this year. So they said that they, they had an operating loss, meaning they spent more than they gained. And they, they gained, missed earnings. Right. They, they gained this much money, but they spent Eight billion more dollar, eight billion more yen than they gained. So, uh, as a, a small crash course for anyone listening that wants to, uh, just like a, a very base level explanation, a lot of your stock price, your stock price will respond very negatively to missing earnings. You know, if you beat earnings, the expected earnings that you say you're expecting slash investors are expecting, uh, your stock price will jump. If you miss earnings, your stock price will drop. And so companies will do everything they can to soften the blow of how they talk about missing earnings so that they can soften the amount you drop. Uh, so if you're wondering why it's talked about in, I mean, that's cold, hard numbers. They weren't, you know, obfuscating anything, but why they might use language that makes it seem like they didn't really have much of a hit at all is because they don't want their stock price to you know, drop off a cliff for good reason, right? It's a, this is just good business. Um, so really what, what those numbers say is that uh, not only did they miss earnings, they also spent more money than they did last year, which meant that they overall, uh, they had a loss is what it sounds like. I, I haven't looked at it myself, but that would be, that'd be pretty bad. That's, you know, I don't know if that's indicative of say like a franchise losing steam, which is, sort of what i'm right. supposing and, and and this is what i talk i made a whole video about this and i kind of went over step by step like number one there's the obvious elephant in the room which is both Final Fantasy 16 and Final Fantasy 7 rebirth were playstation 5 console exclusives not even on pc right. Final Fantasy 16 came out on pc like two days ago right finally uh which so too bad because i actually quite liked Final I mean, I, I again, I enjoyed the game. It's just, it's, it's not my favorite Final Fantasy, but I, it was enjoyable. It ended up not having the substance, right, that I wanted from it. But, but yeah, the obvious elephant being that, like, they took an exclusivity bribe from Sony, and it is not paid off. It didn't pay off for sixteen. It's not paying off for seven Rebirth, and by all accounts, Rebirth is is a significantly bigger, better game than Remake, even though Remake has sold a lot more. At this point, so basically, Square is saying it straight out loud now. We are Final Fantasy is not making money. Final Fantasy, mainline titles, remakes of the most popular game in the series, they are not making money. We are not making the money we thought we were going to make on these. You know, the whole emergency button meme and everything turned out to be, you know, a, a fool's gold. Um, turns out, remaking Final Fantasy VII is not the guarantee of of instant flow of cash that you that we all we all thought it was yeah. and i was like so why is this i'm like i i think exclusivity is is yes exclusivity is a problem putting like a lot of people were saying like well you know nothing there's so many less ps5s in the world and it's like motherfucker there are 62 million ps5 sold worldwide yeah it's it, it's it is tracking at the same or ahead of where the ps4 was and in its point in its life, 62 million, like, let, let me just put that in perspective. That's like almost as much lifetime as the entire Nintendo entertainment system. It's around there. That's, that is as much as the Nintendo entertainment system, the entirety of it sold worldwide. It is more than the Super Nintendo. It is more than the N64, more than the GameCube, obviously. It's more, obviously more than the Wii U. It's, it's more, it's more than the original Xbox, obviously more than the Xbox one or the series S um, it, it's like, as far as like console sales go, like it's like okay, PS2, P PS3, PS2, PS1, you know, all the PlayStations obviously sold more in their lifetime, but like Nintendo has only ever had so far the Wii and the Switch to match it. But, anyways, we're getting off topic here. A lot of PS5s are sold, there's a lot yeah. of PS5s sold in the world, so we really can't keep using the argument of that there's not a lot of PS5s out there, but but it is a factor. It certainly is because there's no guarantee that all those people who bought PS5s are doing it for Final Fantasy because Final Fantasy, at the end of the day, 
is an aging franchise. This was sort of my last point, which is I think the franchise is aging. And a lot more people are coming around to this idea now, which is that it's it hasn't really it hasn't like people aged up and a lot of people when they age up, they, you know, hey, I played this in my youth. But it's like, okay, like to be real, Andrew, like a game you bought enthusiastically when you were 20 ish, 21 ish, whatever, you're probably not buying every new entry in that franchise. You are not buying every new Call of Duty that comes out right. every year. Yeah. You, you you just you just move like and because as much you we're enthusiasts we love video games but it's like we we're not sitting here buying every single game ever like there's very few things that I'm like I am there day one I'm there I am there no matter what right well there's also just more choice today than there was say 15 years ago yeah like by a lot like and a again, stupid amount and going back to what we <laughs> said though like with Sonic and Pokemon what does Sonic and Pokemon do they refresh their user base because you're way more enthusiastic and ride or die for a franchise when you're younger than when you get older like, I mean, then you, and you start playing a bunch of million other things and you, you just sort of like don't have time or money for, for the games you did. You just don't have the time, you know, and you, you know, at our age is that, that we did when we were, we were, you know, well, 20. even, even the, I th maybe it was the director of final fantasy 16 has even said like, part of the problem is that only the people who have played Final Fantasy in the past know that each game is a new game. Yeah. And so by calling something Final Fantasy 16, it may have actually hurt it because, you know, say Gen Z, who the the Final Fantasy before 15 had been a decade plus before that. So they look at 16 or 15 and they go like, well, I don't want to hop in on the 15th game. But the thing is with that is, and that's why I think that proves because people, a lot of people are bringing this up. You should, we should probably stop calling them numbered. And I'm like, 15 disproves this entirely because 15 is the best selling Final Fantasy game. Yeah. And but 15 also had the advantage of being multi platform when it came out. Well, yeah. Okay. So I would agree with you there. I've been saying that exclusivity is sort of a losing game for a while now, but. What I do think is the 15 had like a load of hype around it based mm -hmm. because it had been so long since the Final Fantasy had come out. And the game in particular was like a decade in development. Yeah, I I, I don't know if it's fair to say that 15 is a reliable pick. Like if you were basing 16 sales based on how well 15 did, I don't know if that's necessarily fair. Now, I would say that uh, I I expected Rebirth to, I mean, go to the moon. Like, genuinely, I expect, not only is it good, it is really good, but also it's one of, like, the core games, you know? Like, to have an identity as a gamer. Yeah. You know, had, to have an identity as a nerd in the last 30 years there's Final something seven yeah. is like you base your whole it, it was like if you were at the right age in the late it's 90s basically yeah you base your whole identity around one one of the games and final fantasy 7 is one of those games that you're like what are the if we had to think of the top games of the late 90s early 2000s that you know like i did re4 <laughs> like you know, RE4 is my whole personality. There's a whole lot of douchebags like me that picked RE4 as our personality game. And FF7 was that personality game for, like, a lot of people. <laughs> Woe to the people that chose, like, Crystal Chronicles. <laughs> you know, what depression they must live in now. But my point is, is, like, there is that, like, when you're at the right age that you pick that game, and that game becomes kind of your your core gamer identity. Yeah. Final Fantasy 7 is a big one. Max, Max, why am I, how did I, Max is, loves Final Fantasy 7 on a level that like, it had to hit him at that like, right. 14, 15 year old, like, this is my identity now. <laughs> you know, I thought that Final Fantasy 7 Rebirth was going to like, <clears throat> absolutely dominate. Like, if you, if you would have asked me, would it sell consoles? Final Fantasy VII Rebirth might be one of the last ones that I thought exclusively would sell. Like, I don't think exclusivity sells consoles anymore. 
I, I, I actually sort of think. Yes and no. I think. I, yeah, I do. I, I'm with you there. The only one who can get away with exclusivity is Nintendo because it is truly exclusive. There's no caveat. There's no exclusive for three months. Three exclusive for a year. There is no. There is. There is no window period when it's a Nintendo published game. It's like and this is never coming out anywhere else. It's only going to be on this thing. Their exclusive games, a lot of the time, because of how they build their consoles, don't work on other platforms anyway. Even if they did get released, the gimmick yeah. doesn't work, right? Um, Nintendo, it's why I keep saying Nintendo is sort of its own its own beat. They're not even playing the same game the other two are anymore. Yeah. But no, I, I I definitely I think you're right. Yes, exclusivity for Nintendo, you buy into an it's, ecosystem. It's, it's the only one that it's the only one that has that anymore. The rest of them you're out. I think you're right. It just convenience is, is too too king. Now there's a lot of things we can talk about specifically towards rebirth, which is there's all these doors, all these doors got put in the way between let's say you had a PS4 vanilla or pro, and then you got remake because COVID, of course, it hit right as COVID was hitting. So here's Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. Um the the DLC integrate was PS5 only. You needed a new console only. You needed to spend this extra money. You needed, you also needed to have played. You don't need to. I mean, they have a recap video, but like it is the second game of a trilogy of a of a strictly linear trilogy. It's a part two of three. It's not even the ending. It's just the middle. You know, it, the the game is also heavily reliant on you having played the original. It's not mm -hmm. a true remake. It's actually kind of a weird sequel. Like all these doors, and you didn't know that. We didn't know that remake was actually technically a sequel until we got through remake so that was added in it's like hey this this is this is not for newcomers this is actually a sequel this you need to have played the original you need to know the original you need to have right. you 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 want to play the in-between mission you need to have a new you need to get integrated you need to get this extra version of the game second version you need to get a new system it only plays on this one new system you can't try to marvel my games so they did this really yeah. stupid thing so square kind of did it to themselves you know, in, in a way where it's like, man, if you had made Intergrade and Rebirth available to all the people who bought it on PS4, I guarantee it probably would have done better. Yeah, and I'm sure they're going to like have some sort of package deal in the next year or two that's going to be like all of them together. Or when they launch the PS6, <laughs> they'll re-release as a well, group deal. And, here's, and think of it this way. Here's, here's the crazy thought here, which is... I think the best I, I truly think the best thing Square can do to sort of like dig themselves out of this this sort of grave they're putting Final Fantasy in is that like uh, uh, granted I know Japan is a very small market overall but like it's still a big market for Final Fantasy they can still sell a couple million over there right yeah they need to put Final Fantasy 16 and remake rebirth on the switch too like they should just put them on the switch too Japan has shown they are not interested in PlayStation 5 period. Well, and they weren't really all that hot on PS4 either. What they are hot on specifically is the Switch, so it could at least maybe net you another million million or two sales for for either game. This is such a I'm sure we've done an entire episode about it. I mean 450 something episodes in, we've done an episode about everything. But like I've said it before, I have a great gaming PC, but like I prefer to game on console. Uh, I think it, it, games just are better on console. Yeah. Uh, it's purpose built. I like using a controller. There's a lot of reasons that I like consoles over PC gaming. Um, consoles are closer to PC or PCs today in both size energy requirements space require just like space requirements than they've ever been like consoles used to be smaller more convenient to put away but now they're basically the size of a small pc tower anyway japan is the this is something cultural that is one of the coolest things about just the japanese that i've ever heard of and any japanese listeners want to correct me on this cool because it is something that was told to me they believe in this idea of enough like they don't want a bigger apartment just to have a bigger apartment they don't want you know like they want the thing that suits 
the lifestyle they have right now, which is a very cool concept to have culturally. Like that's admirable. Um, you know, it's millennia, not millennia, like minimalism sort of ingrained culturally. So when they look at a PS5, the size of a PC tower, or they look at something they can take on the train or, you know, wherever they are, they're going to choose that every time. And so, yeah, I think you're right. The fact that a, that they're going to get PlayStation 4 performance out of a Switch 2, just think about how beautiful PlayStation 4 games were. Like the leap from PlayStation 4 to PlayStation 5 is probably the smallest leap we've had generationally ever. ever. PlayStation 4 games still look beautiful, and we're going to have that in a handheld. And I sort of think... This is one of my why my big brain. I think Sony's totally going to release a handheld in the next few years mm -hmm. because Sony's figured out that they can get PS4 performance out of a handheld. I think, I think you're right. I think you could have, you could have a resurgence of the Japanese. This is, I'm going to go even bigger brain. You could have a resurgence of everything that made Japanese developers great. The weirdness, the off the wall, insular design elements stuff like that, just by having japanese developers focus so heavily on switch 2 because it would revitalize like the the player base in japan it would yeah. it would revitalize like one of the reasons why japanese games and jrpgs and stuff were so sort of wacky and wonderful and the ideas were so great is it was such an insular market like Nowadays, Japanese developers are, in fact, trying to make games for Western audiences. They didn't used to. They used to, like, outside of Japan, they didn't, most developers didn't care who played their game. Yeah. Like, that's a weird thing from all the way up into the early 2000s when they found out, when a Japanese developer would find out that it was really big in the West, mostly you'd get a shrug out of them. Be like, oh, great. Like they cared how well it was doing in Japan, and that's not necessarily true anymore. So I, I sort of, I think Big Brain, yeah, if they released Final Fantasy specifically on Switch Two, not saying exclusive to Switch Two, but if they released for Switch Two, you could have a resurgence of all the things that made Final Fantasy great. Yeah, for it, such it, a long. It, time. it would it would definitely help, but I mean. That's that's like sort of like that's tackling the exclusivity thing. But let's let's talk about the other thing, which is, again, going back to the Pokemon Sonic thing. They're not refreshing their fan base. Mm -hmm. Their fan base is not being replaced or the torch is not being passed. The youths are not turning to Final Fantasy. And you could argue some of that may be the fact that like 16 really tried so hard to go for that Game of Thrones M rated audience. You could argue that Rebirth is a game that requires knowledge of a near 30 year old game. So you need to be old to understand oh. where, or, or very well versed to understand where the story is. And yeah, I did a, a lot of searching for some of the references. Right. So. So both Rebirth and 16, you you could, I mean, a Rebirth, I think is rated T, but it, it's really made for a much older audience. Yeah. And 16 was an, a mature rated game where it's like, they are not going after the Utes. 15, you could argue, was absolutely going after the teenage crowd. Just just from the, the general vibe of the main cast. Um, yeah, a lot of like Gen Z is what, in their early, early to mid 20s now? Well, I mean, here's the thing, and, and, and I want to get, I know, I'm going to, I'm going to get you on a tangent here, I know, uh, regarding everything, but I think the entertainment industry, this isn't just Square, this isn't just video games, this is the entertainment industry. I think the entertainment industry has no idea what to do about Gen Z or Gen Alpha. And in fact, I think we're so hyper fixated on our nostalgia bombing, our nostalgia baiting, uh, our sequels, our pre our prequels, our reboots, our remasters, uh, and and these reboots and, and prequels and franchise games, they're not based off new franchises. Not usually. What coming? What is coming out in theaters right now for kids? Transformers One, a film to celebrate the 40th anniversary. <laughs> of transformers okay fair enough yeah so the kids movies of today are still nostalgia baiting 
people who remember seeing Transformers, the animated movie in 1984 or 85 or whatever, right? Uh you know, what are what are other what are the other big movies in development? Oh, we have a new we have Dinosaur Island Seven. I mean, Jurassic Park Seven. Coming you're uh, you're an elder um, millennial, so this won't hurt your feelings. But one of the worst things that ever happened to the entertainment industry is Gen Xers finally got power in it. Right. Well, this <laughs> is the thing. I, I feel like I feel like we're kind of repeating the same mistakes that the the baby boomers did, which is like we're only we're constantly trying to resell to ourselves in a way. Um, and, and again, like I can't, everything right now is still so hyper focused on this is an eighties movie, Beetlejuice, Beetlejuice. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, just, I could just go down this list. Right. Uh, and, and maybe we creep into the nineties a little bit where you had Jurassic park, you had independence day. Um, obviously not battlefield earth, <laughs> but, but like they, like they were some big franchises created in the nineties and they're like, they're still getting, sequels and whatever and what like the only thing that's kind of new ish is in the only field that actually gets non sequels anymore at all is animation but the minute something does well in animation it needs to have sequel 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 we have like there's like eight minion movies now you can't there's like four despicable me's three minions or something there's like there's seven four shrek movies i found there's four shrek movies. there's there's going to be a fifth yeah there's going to be a fifth toy story you know there's you know, we're just, there's going to be another Frozen. There's going to be, it's like, what did, what happened when Bob Iger got in? What's the first thing he announces? Frozen 3 and Toy Story 5. Great. Well, you know. and, and my point is, this this goes back in and to sort of tie it in a little to video games. There was, you know, a report last year that freaked a lot of people out that said the most played games right now online, multiplayer games, right. are six years old or older. And that freaked a lot of people out because all these projects are almost like doomed. And Concord is the ultimate example of like, hey, we launched a brand new IP. It died immediately. Uh, Helldivers 2 is still Helldivers 2. So why is it six years old? And I'm like, here's why. Because, you know, your Fortnite, your Roblox, your Minecraft, your GTA 5 even at this point, which is 10 years old, 11 years old actually. Um, these are, those are games. GTA 5 is part 5, I understand. But Roblox, Fortnite, Minecraft? That's that is Gen Z's thing. Like it's one of the only things they have that feels uniquely tailored to them. So much of what the entertainment industry has been has been pooping out yeah. for 15 or 20 years has been hyper fixated on the 80s and a little bit of the 90s. They're so hyper fixated because they're so like, okay, well, because guess what? Millennials are the last generation with like a shred of money left, you know, of, of disposable income. So we're, you know, we buy nostalgia big yeah. stuff you know so uh we're just constantly being appeased to no one's thinking about them no one's giving them new things because because one it's scary as hell you know to make a new ip and it's dangerous and risky and yada 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 but i i have to look at it i'm i am i am going to be on the youth side a little bit here where you were born into a world where transformers had always existed where Jurassic Park had always existed. There was no introduction to this. You were not there at the dawn of this franchise. It was just, it existed. Your dad enjoyed it. And at yeah. some point, you know, because again, we're on, I'm, I'm not throwing shade at Transformers fans here, but it's 40 years old. If you're a Gen Alpha, if you're a kid now, looking at Transformers, looking at Transformers now is, is at about the same amount of time that when I was a, a really young kid, here's my grandfather showing me a Popeye cartoon yeah. from, from the 40s or 50s. We're that far away. We are that far away, okay? So I'm, I'm just, just gonna, to put in perspective here, like Transformers is 40 years old. Here's a brand new Transformers movie. Kids go watch it. It's kind of like saying like, it, it, again, it's like, okay, well, here's, 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 I watched this in my youth. Okay, grandpa, like... So, so I've, there's there's this little uh, what you're talking about is uh, in industry the entertainment industry is overly reliant on predictability. They want math to tell them what's yeah, going to make. Yeah, they they want to make science out of art. Yeah, and this is a perfect example of the problems that the industry is having right now. Is you can look at the marketing industry. There's a difference. They differentiated themselves by calling themselves digital marketers. Now. 
I am speaking a little bit out of my ass here because I'm not an expert on all things marketing by any means, but marketing as an industry, say in the 50s and 60s, uh, all the way up through its height in the 80s, uh, was very much acknowledged to be an art. A creative director at a marketing firm would be making half a million dollars a year in some cases, not all cases, but in a lot of cases, they were making a lot of friggin' money because for whatever reason, they couldn't quantify what this person was doing right, but they captured the right thing. The uh, They got the jingle for McDonald's. They, mm -hmm. you know, they figured out the shtick for Jack in the Box, whatever it was, but it was an art form, right? Like propaganda was an art form. So one time I was talking to a marketing, like the CMO, the chief marketing officer of a startup and uh, an ad that I had rewritten for him was doing really well. And I followed the formula that my friend who owned the, the little startup that I was working for made. Basically the whole point, the, the whole trick that we had was we took whatever your product was and we figured out how to tell a story about it. That's it. That just made it more memorable because people remember stories more. But he was like, well, I can't quantify why this is doing better than our old ad. Same footage, same edit. All I did was rewrite the voiceover. But in the new voiceover, it may, it centered the product as a gateway to stories and making memories with your friends. But now every explainer does that. I'm not saying that I was a pioneer. I'm just saying that at the time I did that and it doubled the performance of the video because it's easier to remember you know, what something will give you versus what the product itself does, you know, 1080p versus 4k video, right. But like, what am I going to do with the thing? And the guy was like trying to figure out the math behind it. And I was like, well, marketing wasn't born from math. It was born from literally the best directors of our time going to fucking war and coming and working with psychologists to figure out how to manipulate the European theater and the people back home into supporting the American side. That's it. It was four of the best working storytellers of all time talking to psychologists and making propaganda. And then they came home and found out they could make millions of dollars by selling products in the same way. They didn't use math. Like it is, but all yeah. those guys are dead. Now you have digital marketing, which uses algorithms and, you know, search results and click through rates and all these numbers that can mean anything. Well, the same thing happens in every industry. They want predictability. In the 70s and 80s, guys in the music industry, the highest paid guys in the music industries were talent scouts. They were guys that just had ears that worked good. They knew what was going to do well with audiences. Well, they don't like a shaman working like businesses don't like having to rely on a guy that has yeah. the year they want to know well how what's the yeah, math it's like, it's to like take hiring, anyone like hiring a psychic for your and police case one of the ways that you can tell that the way things have shifted is musicians big musicians Mick Jagger they used to be ugly some of them would be hot but they used to be ugly now most musicians the vast majority of them talented or otherwise all pretty hot. They're all marketable. They're all commercially viable. Hell, I'd argue that started in the late 90s even. Oh, yeah. No, I mean, it started, they've always had plants. They call them industry plants. They've always had that. That's always existed. But now producers, music producers can use sampling and they can literally use math to make a song that they know is generally going to be commercially viable. It might not be the biggest hit of the summer, but like one of the biggest hits this summer was an AI-generated just using samples, beat by number, you know, insert chorus type stuff. This is a thing that has made its way into all aspects of entertainment because, again, entertainment executives all looked at how well tech was doing and were like, well, how do we get those guys to do this? How do we get them to use their algorithm to make sure that we make the most amount of money on the next Marvel movie, the next whatever movie? And it's not just Marvel movies. I'm, I'm shitting on Marvel just because they are the behemoth. They're the biggest guy in the room, so it's easiest to make fun of them. But all studios put themselves in a corner like this. All entertainment has put themselves in a corner like this. One of the most interesting things about the gaming industry to me, or games in general, is they have been chasing the prestige of filmmaking. Yeah. not Maybe they didn't know they were doing it, but they have. 
And I think that the industry has probably been shifting to try and use the same tools that the rest of the entertainment industry has, even though the gaming industry dwarfs the rest of the entertainment industry. They've been shifting to use those same tools. There is a lot of interplay at the executive level between all the different types of all the different sectors of the entertainment industry. And I think they're all running into a corner. I think you're right. They, they, they don't know what to do about a generation that has come up constantly targeted by last generation's nostalgia. Right. And then, I mean, there's, there's another, I mean, we, there's a whole other worm here where it's like, you know, a lot of young kids are used to free, free to play, you know? Oh yeah. Fortnite's well, Fortnite's free to play. All these games are for, for Minecraft. I think Minecraft's free to play. I don't know. Um, or it's cheap if it's not, but because they're used to- there was such a backlash to uh the the trickle spending that they did when they were little little. When yeah. Gen Z was little little, you remember all the outrage there was over, oh, little Timmy got dad's phone and spent four grand on yeah, coins yeah, yeah. for you know that pushback, you know, uh, that directly led to the free to play model. Like that directly led to the models we have today and yeah, probably I mean, why it feels safe. And another one, a big, big one that, that I, I don't think gets enough credit or gets mentioned enough is, is the Genshin impact well, Hoyoverse in general, mm. Genshin impacts Honkai star rail, Zenless zone zero. They do extremely, extremely well. Now I'm not going to get into the, <laughs> the embarrassing, some of the more uh, uh, side eye, like things about like them lately, um, looking at you, Natlin. Um, <laughs> but um, like they're free to play, right? And they run on phones, which pretty much made it a boom economy for not just Japan but China, Korea, as well. Uh, and again, these it, it is what younger, more younger crowd are playing is is Genshin Impact along with Minecraft, Roblox, Fortnite, and they're free to play. In fact, Fortnite is. Probably Fortnite in this weird sort of thing, how people are are still trying to figure out how to make money. And I'm like, but none of you are, is, are doing what Fortnite does. Now, maybe you just, I guess, because because Fortnite's still on the cheaper end of, of how much it costs to buy something in it. Like buying a character in Fortnite is still statistically much cheaper than buying a skin in, in Call of Duty, right? Or Warzone. Right. But I mean, like, that's one reason why they're succeeding. The other could just be general general stuff. But I think a big thing a lot of people kind of miss is that um, Fortnite, you don't have, you really don't have to spend anything. Your game, your gameplay experience in Fortnite is truly identical, whether you spend the money or you don't spend the money. Right. Like it is truly, actually, truly cosmetic. Warzone is not because I'd argue because they because they have to constantly update and, and change their meta for their guns, and because every gun has a literal hundreds of attachments that you have to unlock through playing, they sell loadouts. They sell pre-made uh, attached guns with attachments that have things mm-hmm. you would otherwise need to spend hours and hours and hours getting. So they are actually doing a sort of time-based pay to win not necessarily pay to win is the only way but just like time or time or money based pay to win if you can get the meta early enough you have a much better chance of annihilating everyone you run into right and fortnite doesn't have that there is no loadouts in fortnite there is just what's on the ground well fortnite's model is clearly the idea that if all of your friends are playing fortnite you'll be playing fortnite and if all of you are playing Fortnite, you're more likely to want a costume or cosmetic eventually. They're on the eventually model. Uh, part of me thinks that Activision has never thought about possibility. They've only thought about predictability. It's that same thing that I'm tired of. Like, what can they predict? How can mm-hmm. they ensure that they're going to make money? Yeah, and, and, and how this affects the Utes is they're not used to spending money on games. And they're getting they're getting big big sometimes polished experiences from a game they don't pay any money into i don't you know eventually they will i don't think the thing is is i don't think that it's not that they're not used to spending money like i have plenty of gen z friends that spend money on gaming what i think it is is gen z maybe even more so than millennials just don't have a lot of money so they are extremely discerning or if they're if they're not going to be discerning, they will play the free to play game because it's free, and they'll be very forgiving to a free to play mm-hmm. game. 
But when they do spend money, they're going to be super discerning. Do they want to spend money on a cosmetic in a game that they play hundreds of hours of? Or do they want to take a risk buying some other game? I can see like this is this is a yeah, weird like thing. The, the, the $70 for rebirth is right. like is like buying seven skins or buying 10 skins in Fortnite. It is really easy to try and paint every new young generation. Millennials went through it too, but it's like you try to paint like, I don't know, Gen Z is irrational or whatever. But the truth is, is like they're all hyper rational. Gen Z is super rational. The free to play game makes a lot of sense. A cosmetic in a game that you're going to spend a lot of time in makes a lot of sense. $70 for the 15th or 16th in a franchise. Yes. Okay. It's not actually the 16th game. You know, it's not, it is its own game. Sure. Mm -hmm. But like, that's not entirely clear. Am I going to get it? Or I can just you're gonna go spend it, you're 10 gonna, bucks. And you're going to play it for like 30 hours and you're never going to touch it again. Right. So it's like you, it it I think it helps a lot of people's egos to go a lot of industry professionals egos to say like, oh, Gen Z just doesn't make sense. They make a lot of sense. They make it. They I, I think they weigh the bang for the buck constantly again, which is why we went through all the time to say like, yeah, if you don't have a PS5, grab a PS5 Pro if you got the money. Sure. I don't think it's worth the mid mid upgrade when ps5 hasn't been pushed that's who you're talking to that's the argument you're making you're making the argument to the 20 something year old who is deciding between spending a thousand dollars on a pc or oh they could save a few bucks is the ps5 pro worth it like that's who you're going after yeah i, I think I, in a, I think in a way kind of what you're saying here in general is that the youths are actually a lot smarter than we're giving them credit for almost every time <laughs> Like, like I'm not, you know, one of the things that you see get put around on the internet is like, oh, literacy rates among Gen Z is super low. Uh, one, I don't know how that's necessarily true because you read everything on the internet anyway. Uh, but what they mean by that is like, you read these articles and what they're really saying is like, oh, they don't know how to handwrite. Well, I, it doesn't make them dumb. They just grew up in a world where typing is the thing. Like... Not a lot of people do handwritten notes anymore when you got laptops. Marketing and, and industries love to paint whatever the youngest generation is as dumb or killing an industry. Or when the truth is, is they, they've they gotten into the game late. They know what the game is. They see it. They see how millennials went through it. They see how their Gen X parents went through it. Like, I'm, I'm not saying there aren't dumb Gen Z kids. There's dumb people all the time. Hell, everyone's dumb sometimes. Some people are dumb all the time. But my point is, is like they grew up in a world that did not have nearly as much money as their parents had, just the same way that millennials did. So we didn't buy diamond rings when we got married, and they don't buy $70 games unless it's going to be something they love. They're just as frugal and intelligent as any yeah. consumer is. And, and then, and there's other franchises probably. Gen Alpha, those fucked. Those kids are nuts. Okay, they they don't read good, and they're all ass. I'm kidding. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know any Gen Alphas. Well, I, oh, I, I do actually. I have nephews. Maybe, so. maybe you know. I, I we could probably go into other other franchises beyond Final Fantasy, but Final Fantasy is kind of like front and center right now because now we have literally we have the company itself saying. It's not selling specifically this game. These two games are not selling straight up. Like, so we know and in, in, it's like, it's an aging franchise and some franchises I feel were kind of left to like left to just be aged out. Like Skylanders, they just gave up just cold Turkey. They you let know, it die. Like yeah. Most anything from Activision or Sony, they just gave up and said, well, we're, we're done. And, and I always argue that it's fine to let a franchise die. We don't need to constantly have a new one because and I pose this question to to again, which is more the older crowd because they're they're more millennial for Sly Cooper exactly because there was a fourth Sly Cooper made by a different developer, Sansa or whatever. And a lot of people weren't happy with the story of the game or whatever. I, whatever Sly Cooper's story because of shit. Um, but coon. <laughs> but my my point is is like everyone's like I want a new Sly Cooper. Why won't they give us a new Sly? I'm like, in, if Sucker Punch, who made Sly Cooper, is not interested in doing more Sly Coopers. They're not interested in doing any more infamous, which they did afterwards. They're doing Ghost of Tsushima too. And then, you know, maybe maybe they'll go back to something. I'm like, if if the original creative talent does not want to make part five, do you really want to see a part five made by another third party 
if it's not going to hit the highs of the original trilogy, like, do you want another part four where it's just like, eh, it's not that good. Eh, you know, Oh, some people might argue, well, can't play is still pretty good. And some people say it's not even that good. Okay. Do you want a diminished return? Do you want a lesser part five, not from the original creative talent just to keep mm -hmm. the franchise alive or should the franchise just mosey off into the sunset? I'm, I'm going to end, uh, I'm going to end my commentary on a positive note. What this means for PS6 and you know the next generation is if these franchises aren't pulling returns anymore, this means that we might actually see real investment in new IP. Well, I think the the sort of scary thing is that well, maybe we should just stop making new games. We'll just update Fortnite and Roblox and Minecraft forever. You know, there's no need to make new games anymore. The kids aren't going to buy the new games. And and I think my thing is we need to stop, stop trying to get, stop going after the millennials, but because a person our age is career family, you know, child raising, they have a lot more on their plate They're, I mean, yes, they may have the disposable income, but they're going to weigh heavily what they can and can't spend $70 on. And if you want to get people enthused about stuff, it's maybe it's time to start really trying. And this is the scary part, trying to look for that creative spark for something new. That's going to be the next quote unquote, this, what is the next transformers that right. will have 40 years from now? We'll be celebrating its 40th anniversary because it was so successful and so huge. And it, and it, it transcended generations because again, we, we can't keep, I, I love the eighties, but we really shouldn't be going back to this. Well, every, you know, every year, every single year, every single like thing should not be just digging. Can we dig up a ghostbusters again? Like you can, can only dig... cut that Coke so many times. Like I def like I'm, I'm, I'm more of a defense force of for, for say some of the later indie films, but like people hate the later indie films because they're, because they, they don't want to see their hero age basically. Um, and, and, you know, not even getting into that, but like, uh, part of me is also like, okay, but we do, maybe we shouldn't see, you know, maybe we don't need to see this franchise dragged out and re reheated and reheated and reheated, you know, over and over again. Like maybe we can just leave it as like, well, isn't it wonderful? I mean, I know there's a game, I know there's a stage play, but I'm like, isn't it wonderful that there is no back to the future for isn't it great that we can just look back at the back to the future trilogy and say, man, what a great series of movies, man! That shit, and 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 not go like, oh, it. wish they do another one. I've heard people say, I wish they do another one, and I'm like, why? <laughs> like, like, isn't it wonderful just to say there and be like, that was great? Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're way over time, but I I am gonna. You know why? You know why people say that? Because they want to share that magic with their. They think they're gonna share that magic with their kids. They think, well, here's and here's and here's and here's the secret. Here's the secret. All Back to the Future was was a big giant love letter to It's a Wonderful Life. Yes. Yeah, well, yes. Which which was a movie that was like 40 years its junior. Yeah. Or 40 years its, you know, 40 years its grandpa, I guess you could say actually. And made by Frank Capra and right. was his uh was his response to coming back from World War II. Because Frank Capra was one of those four directors that went and invented all of our modern propaganda. He invented modern marketing. Yeah, that's right. We're circling back to my last tangent. And it, and it wasn't even a Christmas movie originally, but somehow it got made into a Chris all-time Christmas classic. And it didn't even because that's when they'd show it because there's winter. <laughs> Wait, there's winter in the movie, but it was actually not a, I think it came out in July or something. It was filmed in July. I know that. But anyways. Point is, is that Back to the Future was based on this old movie it was a love letter to a film 40 years before before it. And now we can look back at Back to the Future. Isn't that great? You want to share the magic? You want to sh if you want to share that magic and enthusiasm, go make your brand new thing. Make your brand new wonderful life because he didn't like It's a Wonderful Life is not a time traveling movie necessarily, but it is it is an alternate universe movie, which is. Yeah which is Back to the Future 2 more than anything. It's a, it is an alternate history movie. And, and that's what Back to the Future is at the end of the day. It's an alternate history movie. You want to share that? Find a completely new, unique way to make your alternate history, not an isekai, F-U-S-F-U isekais. Um, Andrew doesn't know what an isekai is.
No idea. It, it, it is tr- it is in, in anime and manga. It is traditionally known as a trope where a character uh, gets sent to an alternate universe, usually through death or some other sort of um, me- mega event happening. You, again, usually like they die in one world and they're reborn or sent to another universe. And then they are a fish out of water and they discover the new universe they are in. Um, that is an isekai. Isekai is isekai is, is, is Chronicles of Narnia. Right. That, yeah. that, that's an isekai. It's like a Chronicles of Narnia. But usually an isekai involves like the main character dying and being reborn in, in the new world as something else. So that's isekai. Huge in anime right now. I'm not saying to do that, but I'm just saying go make your Back to the Future. Not right. not not Back to the Future 4. Not Back to the Future. But go make your your new thing. Go make your new thing. Find the creative talent that wants to make that new thing. There's hundreds. There's hundreds out there that are trying to make those things, and they keep. Getting I'm points. not really a huge fan of Alien Romulus. It, it, it was it, it was more just a just a wank off to the Alien fields. At least it looked good, but you know, I you know, go make your own. Go make your new space horror movie that isn't reliant on a 50 year old franchise. Yeah, I mean, I I would love a new horror Alien you know franchise like i don't think romulus is bad i actually think it was it's the terminator <laughs> three of, of alien movies it's not bad it's not great not bad i think it's it's better than terminator three was but also i haven't seen covenant yet so i can't oh my I god can't. Covenant, covenant is such garbage covenant is is can't. covenant is is proof positive ridley scott's lost the plot <laughs> but i didn't see napoleon so uh, I, I don't know. I got to see or, the director's or, cut or, because we're the Green Knight. So Ridley Scott didn't make the Green Knight. Yeah, he did, didn't he? No, that was uh, uh, the Green David Lowry. Thank you. Oh, uh, the Green Knight's great. It is not an action movie. What was the medieval movie that Ridley Scott directed that nobody watched and he blamed all the kids on their phone for? Oh, uh, the Last Duel. Is that what it was? I, I mixed that up with Green Knight. I know uh, it had knights in it. The Last Duel was great. Was that a Ridley Scott movie? Yeah, it was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, bro, Ridley. I don't think anyone marketed that movie. I don't think I ever saw a trailer for it. Yeah, I, I saw. You know what? The biggest problem with that is like Ridley Scott loves to put dogs in the background of all of his scenes, and so when we tried to watch that movie. Every dog that barked, every scene had a dog bark. So my dog would just lose his mind. So we'd have to pause it until he calmed down. Or Do you remember that? I think it was the Guy Ritchie King Arthur movie he made. Yeah. Yeah. That's and the, a fun movie. It's, in the I movie, mean, in, in the trailer, when he's pulling the sword out of the stone, they just zoom into like some big old ass dog, like going Arf, like in slow-mo at the camera. I don't remember that, but uh, I, I remember that, that like in the trailers. Trailers. I remember that in the trailers, and I remember that in movie reviews where they're just like, "What even is?" Because it's supposed to be like a side moment, like every because it's all the it's a montage of reaction shots of all the yeah. people around him as he's pulling this going sword out of the stone, and this dog's going <laughs> what? like okay, <laughs> take this to guy Ritchie. <laughs> guy Ritchie loved them. He got that dog in him. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, on that note, before I send us off into a full hour tangent on movies, uh, we've got some patrons to thank. Uh, once again, Bojack was our dude of the week. Bojack, we've known him for too long, some would say. Uh, but thank you, Bojack. Appreciate you. And our producers for this episode are Dragon Wolf Makoto, Austinite, Zybernite, Tsunami, Croy35, Hyperviper89, HockeyConk64, LCL Mayhem, and Ziggy Z. Thank you, dudes. We'll catch you next time. Later, dudes.